In my previous video, we took a look at the Smith chart and how the impedance and admittance components are represented on the chart and how to convert between them. Today we're going to take a more practical look at the Smith chart and plot an impedance and look at some of the additional scales on the Smith chart to figure out how to extract the reflection coefficient, VSWR, return loss, and more. And then we'll really get into some of the magic of the Smith chart and better understand transmission line effects and what that does to the impedance that's seen looking into the line. So for our example, let's uh, start with an equivalent circuit like a load that looks like a 33 ohm resistor followed by a 220 picofarad capacitor operating at 14.2 megahertz. So we can very simply uh, convert this to an R plus JX uh, type format by converting the 220 picofarads to its capacitive reactance and we wind up with a load impedance that looks like 33 minus J51. It's a minus sign because it's capacitive. Now in order to plot this on the Smith chart, we need to normalize this uh, quantity to Z0 or our system impedance. So we're going to take our 33 plus J51 and simply divide it by Z0 and that gives us uh, this normalized load impedance, I'll just call ZL, which is 0 0.66 minus J1.02. Uh, so let's go plot this on the Smith chart. Alright, we want to plot uh, 0 0.66 minus J1.02 and being a negative J, uh, being capacitive, we're going to be in the lower half of the Smith chart here. So we start off by looking at the 0 0.66 uh, real component, and that is basically right next to this line right in here. And, uh, and then we're also going to look at the intersection of 1.02 on the capacitive side of the uh, reactance scale. So that plots us uh, right here. To verify our point in the Smith chart, I took a 33 ohm and 220 picofarad capacitor soldered them in series across this uh, SMA connector. We'll connect this up to the VNA and verify what that point looks like on the Smith chart. And with the VNA set to test at 14.2 megahertz, we can see our point here, and that's showing 33 ohms and uh, minus 51 ohms of uh, reactants. And uh, that basically matches, uh, if you look at uh, this point here with respect to the center of the chart, uh, we're right in the right spot. So we've computed that correctly. Now once we know uh, the load impedance, we could, if we wanted to, calculate the complex reflection coefficient. Remember all these values are complex values, so this is not an easy computation. We could uh, generate, get the magnitude or uh, reflection coefficient, often called rho, just by taking the magnitude of uh, that complex value. We can compute the voltage standing wave ratio, or VSWR, the power reflection coefficient, or the return loss. That's a lot of calculations. Or we can actually very simply just read them off the Smith chart. Let me show you how you do that. With our normalized load impedance plotted right here, we simply take a set of dividers or even a just a ruler and measure the distance uh, from the origin or center of the chart to our load impedance and transfer that measurement down to these lower radial scales. And these scales have got uh, a number of different axes. Let's take a look at them. We transfer that radial distance from uh, the center line here uh, out here to the left and the lower scale is the one that says reflection coefficient ERI. That's our complex reflection coefficient and we can see that crosses right at 0 0.54. That's the magnitude or rho of the uh, complex reflection coefficient but how do we get the angle? If we take a look at the circum circumferential scales here. This one here says this is the angle of the reflection coefficient. So this scale right in here that's going from 20, 30, 40, etc. And we take a close look at that. We can see that if we extend the line of our uh, normalized impedance out to that scale, we can see that we cross right at about 76 or minus 76.4 degrees. So our complex reflection coefficient is 0 0.54 at an angle of minus 76.4 and our rho is just 0 0.54. So the next axis up is our power reflection coefficient. That's simply just the square of gamma. So that is about uh, 0 0.3, actually closer to probably 0 0.29. We can kind of see it's crossing just to the right of 0 0.3 here, which means that basically 30% of your power is reflected if that's what your load looked like at the end of a 50 ohm transmission line. Uh, we go to our next uh, one up here. We look at our return loss. That's about 5.25 dB. Uh, the next uh, scales up are for SWR. The top one is uh, is linear. 
that cross is rated about uh, 3.4 so our SWR is 3.4 to 1 and represented in dB it's just a little over uh, 10 dB about uh, 10.6 10.7 dB or so so very easy to, to yank these parameters right off the Smith chart without doing any calculations next we'll take a look at uh, transmission line effects on the Smith chart and what do I mean by that well, when you add a transmission line at our system impedance, like a 50 ohm line in this case, between the source, being a generator or a transmitter, and the load, a couple of things happen. Uh, the VSWR uh, seen by the source looking into that transmission line is constant, regardless of that line length. And that's, of course, ignoring losses, which we're going to do in this case here. But the impedance looking in that line uh, seen by the source changes with the line length. Let me say that again. The VSWR stays the same, but the impedance changes. You might say, how does that, how does that happen? Well, here's an, here's an example of how two impedances can give you the same SWR. If you had a, a simple resistive load of 25 ohms or a resistive load of 100 ohms at the end of a transmission line or just at the output of a generator, both of those will result in an SWR of 2 to 1. So this, you know, just one example illustrates the point that you can have different impedances that give you the same SWR. Uh, the same holds true for complex values of Z. So the calculation of that input impedance as a function of line length is pretty ugly, involving hyperbolic tangents and all that stuff. But with the magic of the Smith chart, this is a piece of cake. Let's go take a look at what I mean. Now any circle on a Smith chart that's drawn concentric with the center represents a constant VSWR or constant return loss no matter where you are on that circle and as you can imagine any point on that circle represents a different impedance so this impedance right here that we plotted earlier uh, has got the same return loss the same SWR as any other impedance represented on that circle now rotating around the Smith chart represents either adding or subtracting line length so a complete trip around the Smith chart represents a half wavelength of transmission line length Therefore, the input impedance looking into that transmission line is equal to the load impedance whenever the line length is a multiple of a half wavelength, or another way to say that is an even multiple of a quarter wavelength. Now, that's regardless of the line length and the load. So it could be a 50 ohm line, it could be a 100 ohm line, it could be a 75 ohm line. As long as that line length is a half wavelength or multiple of half wavelength long, the impedance looking into that line is equal to the load impedance. Now, so therefore, halfway around this chart represents a quarter wavelength line. And this is kind of a special line length because it does some interesting transformations to the impedance. A quarter wavelength around a line that is open at the far end will look like a short when looking at the near end. And vice versa, a quarter wavelength line that is shorted at the far end will look like an open at the near end. So, a really interesting impedance transformation. Uh, this is used uh, for what are called quarter wave, transmission, quarter wave transmission line transformers, and we'll talk about that in a future video. So for any impedance, if you draw a circle through that impedance, you can show how that impedance varies with line length. So here's our initial impedance, ZL, and if we draw a circle uh, that uh, coincides with that radius, we've got our constant VSWR circle. And of course, where that crosses the zero reactance line, we drop a perpendicular line straight down. Uh, here's the measurements that we transferred earlier down to this axis to determine SWR, return loss, etc. Let's look at the axes that help us with transmission line issues. We notice these two labels over here. This one says wavelengths towards generator with an arrow pointing in this direction. And this one says wavelengths towards load with an arrow pointing in that direction. You'll notice that they're both start at zero here. And if we go halfway around, both of those axes now end up here at 0.25. So as I said, halfway around the transmission, the Smith chart represents a quarter wavelength line length. So if we continue to go all the way around, we can see we start approaching. Here's 0 0.48, 0 0.49, and then this would be 0.5, but we're back at zero because when we reach a half wavelength, we've replicated the impedance that's seen uh, at the far end of the line. So we can use this constant VSWR circle and these various axes to predict how this impedance will get uh, transformed into a different impedance when you start adding or subtracting line length from that load to the generator.
All right, so here's our example. Again, we're going to continue to use our test frequency of 14.2 uh, megahertz, right smack in the, the 20 meter phone band for us at radio amateurs. And I've got a, uh, a piece of coax here that has got a coax velocity factor of 0 0.66, which means that the, uh, the speed of the wave through that coax is 66% of the speed of light. And the length of that is uh, just about one meter. So let's figure out how many wavelengths long this is. So in free space, uh, we want to calculate the free space wavelength of our 14.2 megahertz signal. That's 300 divided by 14.2 gives us uh, 21.13 meters. Now to determine the length of coax, we can just multiply by the velocity factor. So we know that the, the length of coax that would be a one wavelength long would be 13.95 meters. But I've only got one meter of that, so we simply can invert that. And now I know that that one meter length is 0.0717 uh, wavelengths long. So let's go to the Smith chart and see how to predict what that input impedance will be looking into that transmission line. Okay, so our original known load impedance is uh, plotted again right here. And uh, again, we're going to follow this axis now clockwise around because that's where it says we're going to go wavelengths towards the generator. So as I add uh, transmission line length, I'm essentially moving the uh, generator further away from the load. So I'm rotating in this clockwise direction. So we just need to rotate essentially 0 0.0717 wavelengths. So how do we do that? We extend again this line down here. We can actually read uh, from that uh, appropriate scale how many wavelengths uh, we're starting from. It's just a starting point. We'll call that 0 0.356 wavelengths right here. So we want to essentially add uh, 0 0.0717 to that. So we want to wind up at a reading that is 0 0.0717 wavelengths away or at 0 0.4277 on that scale. So we put a little tick mark there, draw an, another uh, line right back up through to the center of the Smith chart and where it crosses our constant VSWR line, that is the input impedance looking into that one meter length of line. Let's uh, verify that on the VNA. Yeah, but first we need to actually determine what that impedance is. So we just essentially can read off the scales here. We're at about uh, uh, 0 0.355 on the uh, real or resistive circles and we're at uh, about minus 0, excuse me, 0 0.44 uh, again capacitive on the uh, reactance uh, circles and so if we unnormalize that multiply both these values by 50 we get an impedance of about 17.8 minus J22 ohms now we can go to the VNA so here's our measurement with the load directly connected to the VNA so let me disconnect that load and I'm going to add the connected to the end of the 50 ohm transmission line, one meter length long, and then connect the transmission line to the input of the VNA. And there's our point right there. And we're measuring, we can see that, about 18.2 minus 22.6. Uh, and we were predicting that to be 17.8 uh, minus J22. So uh, that's uh, pretty close. A more common use case probably in the uh, amateur radio world is kind of almost going the other way. Well, you, with an analyzer or something like that, you may measure the input impedance at the transmitter, looking into the coax that the transmitter sees. So you're already some distance away from the antenna. Uh, so if you know the line length, you can then use the same trick we just did to rotate towards the load instead of towards the generator. So we can understand what the actual impedance is at the feed point of the antenna. And then you can design a matching network to place at the antenna feed point. And by doing that, it keeps the SWR on the transmission line uh, near one-to-one, -one, and that minimizes loss. Uh, you certainly could just design a, a uh, matching network to match the input impedance of the transmitter. It doesn't change the SWR on the line, but it does allow the transmitter to put out full power. So again, going the other way is probably the more common use case in amateur radio use. Well, so we took a look at how to plot a complex uh, impedance on the Smith chart, how to determine complex reflection coefficient and SWR return loss, uh, and then also how to take a look and see what the impedance looks like with different connected line lengths to that load. Uh, as always, all of these notes will be available in a PDF file and a link uh, in the video notes down below. If you like what you saw, 
uh, give me a thumbs up. Uh, please subscribe if you haven't done so already. I'd uh, love to hear your comments in the comments section, and thanks again as always for watching.